And uh, here we go. Hey, everybody. It's uh, another episode of Low Def Moment, a show where I talk to, my name's Ian Davidson, talk to a business owner, entrepreneur, etc. about their business, what they've got going on in their world, and possibly talk to them, hopefully, about how they use social media to uh, better their business, etc. This week, we have Andrew Lanning on the uh, episode, uh, co-founder of Integrated Security Technologies. Uh, how, how's it going, man? Good, good. Good to be here, man. Thanks for giving me a shout. No, no, this you know is, I mean, I, I like to talk. You know how I am. Yeah, no, this is really cool. Thanks for being on. And just a quick, uh, quick disclaimer, I do know Andrew uh, through Think Tech Hawaii. We are paths cross a bit, uh, a, a bit and uh, he has a show on there called Hibachi Talk. So we might talk about that in a little bit. But let's talk about integrated security technologies. What do you guys do? Sure. We are a uh, electrical contracting firm, but we specialize in electronic security systems and system integration. So, you know, we install all the pipe, cable, wiring, but then we also load all the applications in the database uh, software, uh, configure that test and train the users on how to use their systems. And then, of course, we maintain those systems um, for them over, you know, the lifetime. We've been uh, almost up uh, 19 years in business. Wow. So, I took a look at your website, looked around what you, you guys do, and you talk about <coughs> electronic security and biometrics and all of that kind of stuff. So you, you guys are doing biometrics? Yeah, biometrics have been a big part of the industry, uh, primarily in the DOD space for many, many years, uh, which is sort of where we started. Um, but the price point has come down now where a lot of commercial entities are starting to add biometric functionality to their endpoints. Um, you know, biometrics just lets you have that uh, second or third form of authentication. You know, we hear about 2FA in like an online account where you use a password, but then you might put in a PIN code like you do at an ATM, for example. So biometrics does the same thing for us at a door uh, where someone may have presented a card. But, you know, hey, I also want to make sure that that's really them. So I could do an iris scan or a, a fingerprint scan or whatever it may be and add that level of authentication to a, a facility entryway, for example. Does a facility use biometrics because the stuff that they are securing is more important or is it that the technology, like not having that layer of security also added on top of, say, the password or the PIN code or the card swipe, it, it, are they doing that because those lesser, for lack of a better word, uh, security systems aren't as good? Yeah, you know, you there's a couple ways to look at it. The 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 DOD tends to re have some requirements like that around uh, multiple forms of authentication. But as soon as you get outside of that space, um, you know, a, a commercial entity probably didn't do biometrics because the price point for entry was kind of high. So they may have a card plus a pin, which is something that you have and something that you know. You know, so that way, if an employee loses a card in the parking lot, a guy can't just walk up to the door and badge through the door, right? So if I have if I have turned on two factor with card plus pin, um, then I've got you know that additional level of assurance, and that still is probably adds a hundred or one hundred fifty bucks per door higher than just a standard card reader. But when I add a biometric, you know, be it an iris scan or a fingerprint scan, or these are now I'm adding used to be thousands of dollars per door, but now I'm adding several hundred more for each opening. So where I'm using that, so that's why the adoption in the commercial space has been a bit slower. So, but the adoption is come is there it's happening yeah the, the price point finally came down to where it's you know obviously if you um say i use it up at my ex perimeter doors you know once i've got let people in my facility I've, I've authenticated them uh maybe two or three ways so therefore i know they're okay so then i can let them i don't need it on every door but um so the idea is to put it on the perimeter and then use a lower level of authentication inside or Maybe I've only got one area that really needs a higher level of assurance before someone goes in there. And maybe at that particular uh, entryway, I'll go ahead and use biometrics there where everywhere else I'm just maybe using card or card plus pin. So there's a couple of different ways to apply it depending on the, the size of the facility and the, the level of risk that they can assume for the you know materials or personnel inside of their facility. What industries are, are coming to a business like yours looking for security? Uh, so data centers, financial centers, um, supply chain to DOD, we typically see it there. Our hospitals, we tend to use um, a two-factor, uh, you know, kind of card plus pin. Uh, they have a lot of requirements around 
um, where where people can come and go at. And so they tend to do a lot of access control interior. And if you're using multi-factor, that slows people down. But a lot of times they'll have a car plus pin. Um, so they're not necessarily doing biometric. Um, you know, biometric is that that thing that you are. So, you know, we, we talk about three forms of authentication, something you have, which is your card, something you know, which is that code, and then something you are. And, you know, that's considered sort of the highest level of assurance other than personal identification. Like when I see you, I know that that's you, and that's still considered the highest form, despite all the, the Tom Cruise movies where they're all wearing masks and stuff. You know, that's a... People don't do that, right? People don't. People aren't coming up to the front door in masks trying to, you know, be all I, Mission Impossible, are they? No, they are. I've been I've been at it for twenty years and haven't seen that. Um, <laughs> I don't know that it doesn't occur in, in the movie level. Uh, people do wear masks to thwart cameras, however. So you know, uh, it's really easy to wear uh, to put a to obscure or obfuscate your face if you're trying to not be detected by a surveillance camera. So that's something. That's one reason cameras sort of. Are not are not really security. You know, cameras are a form of evidence gathering. Uh, realistically, speaking of sort of uh, peering in on somebody from above, I like I said, I looked at your website, and one of the things that uh, you highlighted that you guys do is audio visual security, and mm-hmm. as in you know, in sort of the verbiage on your thing is about listening. What you know, listening to what's going on in your business. Are people listening? Are companies out there like miking up? Uh, you know, it's their business, it's their security. Are they miking up rooms like so they can listen in on their employees? Not without telling people. It still requires uh, um, permission. However, um, in a space where you're looking, say you're watching a parking garage, for example, um, you know, you've probably got a call button there in case someone needs assistance anyway, like you see the blue towers, right, the code blue towers. So, there's absolutely a, a lot of benefit to be able to speak into that space as well as to listen from it, right? Mm-hmm. So a lot of times you, when you've got, say you just put a camera out on a parking lot of, of let's say, a, a auto car lot, right? And some kids are out there vandalizing the cars, for example. When I can take audio and project it out there to them as well and let them know that I see them, they're wearing a blue shirt, brown pants, uh, police are on the way, that tends to get them moving off the site quite a bit quicker, which is what you really want them to do is stop what they're doing, where the surveillance alone only allows me to see what they what they were doing. So being able to interact uh, audibly or visually, you know, audio uh, with audio into a remote site is very, very important part of being able to actually have surveillance on that site. Sometimes the way you, you may see two people interacting and think that they're fighting, and if you could listen to what they're talking about, um, perhaps you'd find out that they're just uh, very excited about a sale that they found or something, you know. So um, there's um, a lot of reasons, a lot of benefit to being able to have audio in a place. And typically the law just says we have to put signage up to indicate that people are under surveillance, that uh, audios may or may not be being recorded. It, it, so does is this what integrated security technology does? They, you'd set up the cameras and all of that audio stuff for a company? Yeah, we ins- we install all that infrastructure cabling, so you know conduit and cabling, and then we would install the equipment itself. We specify it sometimes if the customer doesn't have a consultant they're working with or someone or doesn't know what they need in the design, they may come to us with a problem, and we'll design a solution for them. And then once it's installed, you know we've picked some sort of a platform to drive that with, uh, be it an access control platform. Um, some folks like to drive from a video surveillance platform. Um, and then, you know, intercom is typically just a feature that's used. You you can imagine putting a card reader on a door and someone arrives at that door that doesn't have access to the facility. Well, they need to call somebody or they're going to start banging on the door. Right. So intercom kind of goes hand in hand with access control. Um, and, um, then there are, uh, in, typically you've also got an intrusion layer there as well. You know, we, we sense the door positions with an access control system, our, you know, we want that um, door position known. So I know when it was open with an authorized card read or I know if it was open from the inside by an authorized request to exit. But if it gets forced open uh, without a card read or a request to exit, I need to know that as well. That's a break in. So um, access control is doing a little bit more than people think about. A lot of people that, that use it just think it's like electronic door opening, but we're actually sensing that door position. And I also know if I can set that an alert if the door gets held open, let's say for 60 seconds or 90 seconds when people stopped uh, smoking inside buildings and everybody had to go outside to smoke. We used to get a lot of doors propped open because people would want to go out outside and smoke for a few minutes and then come back in the same door. But if the door had access control on it, it would have a door held alarm. And so that would let us know what was going on because typically the smoking was supposed to be done in a certain area, not out in the back 
warehouse area or whatever it may be. So there's a lot of stuff happening with an access control system, and that tends to be the platform that we drive from. And all the other all the other sensors and all the other uh, equipment is kind of peripheral, and, and all those activities are related inside the database. So when I need to see what occurred, I can go in to an, an, an event of some type. Maybe it was a door opening event. Maybe it was a door held event. And with the click of a button, kind of pull up that door event, know who, who used the door, the video associated with it, the last time it was used, uh, maybe if there was audio associated with that file, whatever it may be, lets me very quickly get a report on what occurred. I've, uh, if you just heard that, that was the the, uh, the company dog over there freaking nice. out about something. Um, very cool. You've been doing this for a very long time. Long time, it sounds like. You've been a security guy. And... Over this time, you you know you were talking basically about technology here, and you've seen things get uh, progress over this time, obviously. And what do you see as the next security sort of technology coming? You know, what space should people be looking at if they're thinking about, you know, the future and securing their their space, their perimeter, if you will. <laughs> yeah. So I think the perimeter is going to continue to be the focus. A lot of Folks can't afford to secure their entire perimeter. For example, you think of your your parking areas, right, where you've got staff that have to travel to a vehicle. Well, that could be a very large parking lot. So really securing that perimeter is rarely done, yeah? Uh, most people let the perimeter fall back to the building itself, and they can secure the doors, maybe the front door, back door, side door entrances, uh, things like that. So I think the, the pushing out of perimeter security is going to continue to grow a lot of that today is being done with analytics uh, through through video and audio analytics, which have become quite a bit um, more reliable. Uh, we used to get a lot of really bad false positives in the industry, and those the analytic engines have just become uh, much much more robust today, where we're getting you know 98 99 percent accuracy in the detection rates, so very low amount of false positives, uh, meaning that if I'm trying to detect a person. You know, I've said I want pick this large of a pixel. I want it to be this big before I get an alert. You know, it's not triggering because a small cat wandered through or something like that, right? So um, that the analytics on the audio side, you know, we've got a lot. Of, we've got analytics that detect people running, analytics that can listen for the sound of a fight, analytics that can listen for car glass breaking, um, and those are getting very obviously gunshot analytics have been around for quite a while. You know, and so we're getting better even today at pinpointing, you know, what type of weapon fired and actually how far away it was from the sensor. So there's been a there's been a lot of ad advance in analytics. And before these were analytics had to run on a PC, a dedicated server to process it all. Today, we're pushing the analytics out to the edge. A lot of them are being performed in the camera or in the intercom device itself right out at the edge um, so that we're only sending events that are meet a certain threshold, for example, uh, to the server for processing. Um, and I think that that's the next sort of big wave, you know, we're machine learning, uh, obviously we're not, we're not, uh, this industry doesn't, isn't priced where it can take advantage of artificial intelligence yet, but, uh, analytics and machine learning are definitely coming uh, into the retail space first. You know, they're watching dwell times, how long you stood in front of something and trying to, uh, you know, send you a, a quick sale price before you walk away and you know, all that kind of stuff. So. Uh, that space has got a, its own its own um, sort of advances in analytics, and then in the electronic security side, what we're doing, we're definitely interested in finding ways to push, you know, perimeter security out, you know, reliably instead of you know stringing you know fiber optic you know sensors around uh, the entire perimeter. Things like that are expensive to do, and primarily have been within the realm of DoD um, to date. Although there are some some commercial entities that service, you know, that are in the sort of that that uh, the supply chain of regulated industries that um, ha have done a little bit of that that kind of work. You know, it just depends sort of on the environment where you're at. Uh, some of the college campuses have gone to great extent uh, in some of the some of the cities where they have um, uh, more more of a high active crime area near to the campus, and so they've gone to extend in the, those perimeter systems quite a ways out there uh, just to detect things earlier. Um, this, in the same way that you have a burglar alarm and the police are coming, it takes 10 minutes to get there. All, all perimeter detection does is lower, gets you notified sooner that something's going on that you want to detect and lets you respond quicker so that that incident doesn't continue to move in, in closer to your assets. That's, that's, that's crazy. Like I, 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 a lot of that stuff is really interesting to me, and I think I could probably talk to you forever about it. But <laughs> But I do need to talk to you about social media because that's sort of yeah. what I do. Let's and I do like that. I like to hear what other people are doing. And 
only because you know everybody is told that they need to have it and you know I have people come to me and say hey uh, everybody says I've got a business online I need to have it what am I supposed to do and every sort of story is different and I went to your website that's usually the first thing I do and I look at a person's website and I see what social media accounts are that do they just put right there on their website and you've got a few out there. You've got you, one. You got your website going on out there. Your Facebook, your Twitter, LinkedIn, Google Plus, uh, that paper dot l i thing, and then this YouTube that I talked about earlier to Hibachi Talk. Mm -hmm. um, do you feel like that your social media presence or your online presence is bringing business to you, or are or is it just something that you feel like you need to do? So great. It's a great question, and I, um, I obviously we 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 got our first really large national level deal from Yahoo from our website in 1999. Nice. So we sold services in 1999. I just want to say that. Nice. Um, I don't know if we sold anything since from our website, mm -hmm. <laughs> but um, we you know we obviously uh, were were somewhat tech savvy. And, you know, we always had a web presence and it's been built and kind of, you know, then left a left to linger and then built again over the years. And um, but the, the rise of social media made all of that so much easier. Right. Because all that static data, you know, you want to do things on a website that aren't simple if you're not a, a coder and they're not easy to display if you don't know how to rapidly whip that up. So social media made that so much easier. And the first thing we started with was I think we built a Facebook account for our company. And, you know, we were able to put the events that we host and all that kind of stuff on there. Uh, and it lets you, uh, you know, I, I never really necessarily put up specials, but we would be featured in magazines and I could put that stuff up quickly uh, via it, whether it was a link to an article or a PDF of an article or whatever. I could get it up there. So there, it gave us ways to put stuff out. Um, then I went, I started a, a LinkedIn account for the company as well and did, uh, had quite a bit of success publishing uh, information there. That was relevant and more, more um, uh, not six. I don't know about success, but greater adoption, greater recognition, really from the industry folks on the mainland than was in Hawaii. So my our customer base in Hawaii doesn't seem to spend a lot of time online, actually looking at our social media, for example, um, uh, or, or following it. Or that. I don't I don't find many of them commenting on it near as much as industry peers that I have on the mainland do. Um, so then. You know, we had those two going, and they're they're somewhat static when you compare them to the you know the rise of Twitter and what we were able to do there. Um, I used Paperly to uh, publish a um, a uh, sort of a blog, um, and I was quite active with that for a while until I kind of got used to it. And then I've sort of gotten into the media with Hibachi Talk, so I found that making videos is a lot more powerful than just you know writing stuff. Um, although I did have quite a bit of success taking my blog. Um, which is, you know, original content, taking that out, throwing it out on like LinkedIn and getting a lot of comments. And I use Hootsuite to publish so I can publish those uh, pieces that I think are, um, you know, important. I can either publish them from myself or from our company or from that blog site, which is Security Leadership Institute. Um, some of them, I, I typically will put them always out on our Facebook page and out on our Google page and on our LinkedIn page. Um, if I'm publishing from myself, and it's maybe related to the industry, but not necessarily for IST. Um, I may publish that under my my personal LinkedIn and not uh, IST. Um, so I do a lot of work in the cybersecurity on behalf of our industry, which is not. I don't want people to get confused that IST is in that cybersecurity business. And because I'm out such a proponent, I'm out in you know in the public a lot with that. Uh, there's a bit of confusion there, so I try to avoid that in the social media space where I can. Um, if do you feel here's here's one of the questions that I get from people asking me about it. Do you the amount of work that it takes to run a successful social media sort of presence? It's, it's kind of a lot of work, right? Like for yeah. just one person, if that's the person going to do it, right? On a, from a are you the person, or like does does IST just have sort of you, or do you or do you have somebody handling that? And, and what is that work sort of like? Yeah, so uh, so I do it, which is why it really goes up and down. You know, we when we travel, it goes down. Uh, some events, I'm really good at taking time to to sort of make a presence out of that event and let everyone know that we're there. Ice T's there. We're we're meeting with speakers, or, or we're uh, 
learn something new about the industry and I'll pass that on. So when I'm, when I'm active enough with that stuff and, and taking, you know, being, um, what's the word mindful enough to whip out my camera and, and take a quick shot, um, then that, that plays very well. Um, I, a big integrated marketing campaign. I studied communications. I know what that is. I've yet to be able to, to effectively just kind of keep one going all the time. Cause I, I feel like I'm a bit of a one man army. Uh, I have been able to leverage the other sources of media that I contribute to. So I'm a, uh, a, uh, I don't know, a published writer in some of the national trade magazines. And I'm frequently asked for my opinion on pieces. So I'll you know, when they print that, I'll use that media stuff to help to publish, you know, which drives, you know, definitely drives uh, uh, views of that material, which hopefully reinforces IST out there or, or myself maybe as an SME uh, of it for the industry. Um, but it's not a – it's surely not become a, a mover of business for IST, you know, per se. So I don't take it too seriously. You know what I mean? It's easy to be like a, a legend in your own mind, you know, just because, wow, I put some stuff out and people liked it. Like, you know, I, I'm not a I'm a I'm, I don't feel like a sort of an industry thought leader, but I am a, a pursuer of knowledge and a, a industry thought sharer. You know, I like to I like to share other things that I wow, if, if I find it valuable, I think other people may and hopefully our customers may and kind of understand the, the way we approach doing doing security for them and things like that. So. That's you know that's a, that's super cool that you said that because I you know a lot of people come and they think that it's going to make them money being on social media but I think what I, I try to tell them, a lot of people it can be if you have like the coolest service and you're the coolest cat you know what I mean and the yeah. right person touched you or talked about you you know it's really that sort of uh, gang sort of mentality that ha- happens if you want to go viral and become really big using it but i using it to share sort of your business knowledge and your sort of industry knowledge to promote yourself i think is where you know the what becomes perception becomes reality you know for people and you know when you set yourself up like that as i am the industry leader look look at all this stuff out here that says here's my resume here's all the information <laughs> you put it out there and then people trigger on that and they recognize it and i think that's sort of the payoff in the end for this is sort of when you use social media that's right i have to i have to agree because especially so you know we take life safety very seriously which is what security is at the end of the day you know when i got when i i really there wasn't much of a living and my background was in psychology and, and anthropology right and there's that's either teaching or writing and i end up going back to technology uh, for a career, um, I probably had at that time many, many ways to go. And when I discovered the electronic security industry, and maybe it was left over from my time in the military, but I really felt like, you know, here's a way to take technology and use it to protect people and to protect things. And that was sort of the, the basis. When we first started IST, our tagline was like real security solutions. Um, today, the team's Years ago, they voted that out, and today it's like leading Hawaii to a safer place. You know, so we like to take that, the high-level stuff that we've learned in our DoD spaces, and take that that philosophy and that technology, and then deliver it out into the community of Hawaii because the the our neighbors, our our schools, our, our churches, our businesses all deserve the same level of protection that our, our military has. You know, and so they maybe all can't get there with one. Uh, contract, you know, but they can build towards it and being able to help a customer build over time to continue to improve the security that they have for their, their people on, in their business and uh, the assets that they need to protect to continue to operate, you know, uh, uh, you know hopefully profitably um, is, is important to us. And so that's our sort of the vision that our team has today. And they're out there just doing it every day. You know, I just get to talk about it. And that's that's super cool, and that, that's a, a perfect way to segue out of this uh, episode. Um, keeping people safe. It's you know, it's how can you go wrong with that, right? Uh, I love it. I that's mean, what we do. Yep. I, I think that's interesting. People don't really, oftentimes when I think of security or perimeter, you think of keeping people just out versus keeping <laughs> people safe. You know, yeah. There's people on the inside that need to be protected. You know what I mean? Right There's on. sort of the the flip side of that. Well, a- Andrew, thank you very much for being on the show. 
I really appreciate it. If somebody wanted a business out there wanted to talk to you about upgrading their uh, security, etc., how do they do that? Uh, integrate our istechs.net, i s t e c h s dot net. Look us up. Give us a call. Cool. Awesome. Thanks for being on. That information will be in the description, etc., uh, to this. Um, all right, man. Thank you very much. Hey, Ian. Thanks a lot. Aloha. All right. See you.